Praise the Lord. I just gave you a little display of my dancing abilities. <clears throat> I hope that you like them. Uh, I'll be brief. Hopefully, um, you can make sense of what I'm going to share. This is something that the Lord put in my heart a few days ago, and I've been thinking about this <clears throat> for the past few days. Uh, and it's about waiting on the Lord. I was reading something yesterday, and one of the things that caught my attention the most, it said when we pray, there's three answers that we can get from God. Yes, no, or wait. So when God says yes, we see the manifestation of a prayer immediately. When he says no, this is what I believe. When he says no, it's because what we've been asking for does not go along with his plan for us. So it doesn't mean necessarily that it's bad, but he has a plan that he wants to make sure that happens in our life. So that's why he says no. And the hardest of all is wait. Because the waiting game, I'm telling you, it's not fun. Uh, you know, we're humans, we're anxious by nature, we want to see things immediately. Uh, but as it says in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, it says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So as we go through these things and we wait, <clears throat> It produces endurance in our heart, which builds our character, and in the end, it gives us hope. And I think that's the reason why he does this, makes us wait, because he wants to make sure that as we go through these things, excuse me, we become better people and we grow. He doesn't want us to stay in the same position all our lives. Amen. This is... Uh, progressive thing up until the moment that we part this physical body. Um, so we wait to hear from him, trying to understand what it is that he's trying to do regarding this thing that we're praying for. And this scripture has been shared several times in the past few weeks. Isaiah 40, verse 31. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The pastor was talking about our weaknesses. I believe it was Wednesday. And how we should embrace our weakness because in our weakness, God manifests and that's when we are strong. And that's when we wait, our strength is renewed. You know, we, I don't know, sorry. It's made more sense in my mind. <laughs> so as I was thinking about this, <clears throat> Jody sent me a message last night. And the Lord put something in my heart that reminded me of, of her. And that took me to Ezekiel 34, <coughs> verses 11 through 16. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As the shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep. And I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. 
and I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the ravines and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture and on the mountain heights of Israel, <coughs> excuse me, on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. They shall lie down in good grazing land and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. This is the verse that I will focus on. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. So sometimes while we're waiting, we might get lost. But God says he's going to seek us out. Yeah. We might get strayed. But he gave us the Holy Spirit to steer us back into the path that he laid in front of us. We might be injured, which I see as some of these physical health issues that some of us go through. But he says that he was going to bind us up. We might feel weak, but he's going to strengthen us. So he's going to take care of us all the way through. The waiting game, as I call it in the beginning, is hard. <clears throat> what he's telling us here in his word, what he's going to do for us, and it's not surprising that these things might happen as we wait, because our flesh is going to try to take over right. and try to make things happen instead of just waiting for him to do what he's going to do in our lives. We should be confident and what he's going to do. Hebrews 10 verses 35 and 36 says, Therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. What he promised, we're going to get it. We just need to stand our ground, continue to stand in that word, and make sure that we declare it and believe it with all our heart, because the word of God is true. Amen. And we know that we're going to see his goodness in this land because by us seeing his goodness in this world, yes. that's when heaven, when his will is done in this earth as it is done in heaven. Amen. 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 Made more sense in my mind than just now. So. requests, testimonies, questions?
such a nice day is because God loves me and he made a nice day for me. And, and that just really, just really touched my heart. And I was saying, Lord, that I believe I, uh, my favorite color is magenta. It's kind of orange and red. So whenever the sun would set that color or come up, I always think God was happy with me. And then the other student said, you know, Ken, you got to see the sign that God gives you. And, and, he, and he shows his love to us throughout the day and the, all the blessings that he gives us. Uh, we went to the laundromat, and, and, uh, and, I, and when we went down there, we liked all the working on one side so we keep track of them all. And as soon as we came in there, the ladies left. They, they got their stuff out of there, and one whole side opened up. And, and that may not mean a lot to other people, but it's like God was the timing. Back to what Tim said about the little things, uh, the, they don't mean much to some people, but they do to to us. I remember a few months ago, I went to get some groceries, and I'm very uh, I stick to patterns. I, I don't have OCD, but I stick to some patterns to make sure that I have everything covered. When I leave my house, I take inventory of everything that I'm taking with me. And when I leave wherever I'm going, I do the same thing. I do that every day when I go to work. But this one day, I get to the grocery store, I park, I go in, just stroll in the aisles, like 30, 45 minutes. And after I pay, I touch my pockets and I cannot find my car keys. So I start freaking out. What's going on, what's going on? Well, maybe I left them in the car. So I get to the car and they were in the ignition. Ooh. Not only they were in the ignition, the car was still running. Oh. I left it off. <laughs> <And> <laughs> so I was 
very relieved, but at the same time, I was like, thank you, Lord, that no one took my car because I cannot afford to get another one right now. <laughs> I don't want to take out a loan. But it, it's just an example of one of the many ways that God takes care of us. Because he made sure that no one approached my car and, and took it. Because all they had to do was just get on, put it in drive. <laughs> that was it. My little Zeppelin was gone. Anyway. Praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs>
Young and Josh Berger. You've been raised in the church your whole life, and you just recently started doing drugs, so I was trying to minister to them how to do covenant decrees over their kids and, and mm-hmm. others that uh, just declare that he's <coughs> this is breaking free from them. So if you remember him, yep. uh, the young man that uh, gave me the grandson, he's home now, uh, uh, pretty much is finishing up treatment here. So just continue that the Lord would put good people in his path. Her spirit is going back to the old ways and the old trends and starting all over. So remember Devontae, please, in prayer. I appreciate mm-hmm. it, too. Thank you. Amen. 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 to the Lord this morning. Father, we thank you for bringing us together here in your presence. We thank you, Lord, because where we are gathered together in your name, you are there. We thank you, Lord, for your word, for the manifestation of your promises and your word in our lives, on this earth, and in the lives of those around us. We thank you, Father, for this commandment that you have given us to go out and make disciples of all the nations, Lord. Speak to all the nations about who you are. Show them and share with them who you are and the good things that you've done in our lives through the word of our testimony. We thank you, Father, for your promises. And because of those promises of right now, Lord, we declare your word. We declare the healing and all those that are in the church. Lord, we know that they're being oppressed by all these unseen things, Lord, that are preventing them from being here. thing that I was reminded this morning as I was praying. Mark chapter 10 verse 27 says, Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Amen. Everything that you are wanting that is according to the will of God that I promise you that he's going to do going to happen because everything is possible with him yes. it's just a matter of waiting because when it happens you will be blessed he will be glorified and your testimony is going to touch all of those around you yes. Amen. 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 Friday, 
We're having our Easter Gate House prayer. Um, if you can make it, I strongly encourage you to do so because you're going to come out like a kitty. You're going to go out like a lion. Yes. It's a good time. Have you been hearing anything? What I've been hearing specifically, and I was sharing it with Cindy earlier this morning, is we talked about this, I think, last week, that we're so amazed. We're going to have our Sue Todd lesson after service. Um, is there a sign up sheet in the back? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, come on. It's going to be fun. They always are. Always are. All right. Well, let's speak the word. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you?
Thank you, Lord, for gentle hearts. Thank you, Lord, for gentle hearts. Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful. You 
I love that. I love that tambourine.
I didn't know how this was going to fit in, but I heard it in here yesterday. But y'all just hang back and uh, join in as you learn. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace.
present help in the time of trouble. Lord Jesus, you're always with us. Thank you, Lord, for the reminder when we literally can feel your presence. We just bless you this morning, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, for what has already been done in this service, and how you have ministered by your spirit through your people. We ask you just to continue, Lord, through the rest of the service that we might be blessed, that you would be blessed and glorified through the blessing of your people. And we'll give you all the thanks and the praise for it. And everyone said, in Jesus' name, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Amen. God bless all of you. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team, as always. Appreciate it. Thank you, Roberto. Great job. Thank you for using my several of my scriptures, praise the Lord. Well, our scriptures, I'll have to say we'll share them, praise the Lord, but I do appreciate it. And uh, Thanks to everyone for sharing your testimonies and prayer requests with us. We appreciate it. I believe the Lord has already done some tremendous things just based on those requests that we've made to him today. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. Praise God. God is good. Hallelujah. How many of you remember your first job? My first job was in an orange juice factory. I got canned because I couldn't concentrate. Sally's been with me 35 years. She's the only one that gets my humor, praise the Lord. Thank you, honey. Praise the Lord. That's a keeper, just for you. <laughs> All right, I just think sometimes we just need to lighten things up a little bit. Hallelujah. God's in a good mood. Amen. He's happy all the time. Praise the Lord. Not mad at anybody. appreciates our humor, or at least he, he puts up with it, hallelujah. Well, I want to talk to you about some things this, uh, today that uh, have come up this past week for me personally, and, and uh, so I try to, like all that we've been talking about here is to be sensitive to the Lord, and, and often it's, you know, through, you know, just encounters that we have with other people and conversations and interacting and so forth that the Lord will bring something to your attention something that he's trying to express, at least, uh, to us. And uh, for, for this particular service, what the Lord had been talking to me, I, I was talking to somebody uh, early in the week. Uh, in fact, I think it was my brother, and we were talking about the focus on different aspects of Scripture. And, and uh, he said, well, you're always, you know, you're, you seem to always be talking about grace. Not that he was mad about it, he just isn't quite in the same place, spiritually speaking. He's, he's saved, he's born again, but he belongs to a big church out in California, and there it's not quite the same emphasis that we have, but that's good. I mean, he's, he loves the Lord and, and so on. But uh, I, I tried to explain to him that what, what the Lord has shown me is that, see, they, a lot of people think, well, they talk about hyper grace and all kinds of things like that, but... Generally, the, the opinion is that if you are, uh, if you have a, a, a high view of grace, then you have a low view of the law. That's the opinion. The opinion is if, you, if you're really emphasizing grace, then you're not really staying faithful to the commandments of God or to the law or, or the scripture. Amen. And what I've found is that's absolutely not true. 
in fact, I want to, that's what I want to explain to you this morning, because you'll, you'll be confronted with this, if not by somebody else, by your own mind, your own conscience, your own, I mean, we've all been, if we were in church at any time, you know, in our life, we've had all sorts of different teachings, you know, and not that they're bad, it's just that they're not complete in a lot of cases. And so we still have to deal with those things, even though our minds are renewed to, to uh, truth. There are still lingering things there that kind of come up every once in a while that want to challenge, amen, where we are uh, scripturally, amen. So that's, that's my, uh, my emphasis this morning. And to do that, I want to start in Romans chapter 5 and verse 20. We'll read Romans chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. Praise the Lord. All right, praise God. Moreover, the law enters that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Romans 7 and verses 12 and 13. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me, by that which is good. That sin, by the commandment, might become exceedingly sinful. Now, as I said, a low view of the law produces legalism. That's the opposite of what most people would say. But I'm telling you this morning, and I think based on Scripture, when you don't have a, a high regard for the law, you end up becoming a legalist. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but it's a, a, a high view of the law that makes a person embrace grace. Amen? Amen? Now, it's, I know it, it seems like that's the opposite uh, of what we would think, but it's because most people think that those who talk about grace a lot or those who are always uh, speaking of God's goodness and God's grace and God's mercy and so forth, the idea is that they have a low view of God's law. And those with a high view of the law are the legalists. Amen? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verses 12 and 13. For we dare not make ourselves of the number, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves, and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. But we will not boast of things without our measure. But according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. If you will, Sheila, drop down to verses 17 and 18. Same chapter. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. Amen. So it's a low view of the law that produces legalism. Not a high view, a low view. Amen? Because a low view of the law causes us to come to the conclusion that we can somehow keep it. Right. If it's a low view of the law, we have this idea that uh, we can do it. The bar is low enough for us to be able to jump over it. Amen? Uh, it's a kind of idea that uh, a low view of the law makes us think that Standards are attainable. Goals are reachable. Demands are doable. Praise the Lord. So the law gets softened. It becomes uh, helpful hints for practical living. Amen? It's, instead of God's unwavering demand for absolute perfection, it becomes just kind of guidelines for life. Amen? Look at Mark chapter 10, verses 26 and 27. And 
They were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? Thank you, Roberto. <laughs> and Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it's impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. See, a high view of the law destroys any notion that we can do it. We're not supposed to be able to try to, to accomplish this. That's where the Jews failed. That's where Israel failed. All these things, we'll do it. We can, we can handle it. And before they got it out of their mouth, they were in sin. And then God was then forced to deal with them based on their failure to keep the law. So a, a high view of the law will produce grace. That's, that's the intention of it. That's the reason for it. Amen? Because it, 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 it exterminates every attempt for self-sufficiency, for moral effort on our part. It, it just shows you, I'm a failure at this. I cannot do this. It forces us to embrace grace, to, to reach out for something, amen, that is better than us. Amen? Amen? So look at this again now in Romans chapter 7 and uh, verses 25 through chapter 8, verse 1. It's only like four scriptures or so, but Romans 7, verse 25 through Romans 8, verse 1. I'm not trying to uh, defend the gospel. It doesn't need any defense, but... Uh, I am trying to help each of us to deal with our own little consciences that try to bring up stuff to tell us that, you know, I, I just haven't done enough of this, or I haven't done enough of that, or I'm not being good enough in this area, or I, I, I have failed in that area. All of that, as I said uh, Wednesday night, our weaknesses are the very things God wants to show his authority and his power through. Well, how does that happen if we think, we're doing everything God has commanded. We don't need God. We're good enough to do it. We can keep the commandments ourselves. The reason for the commandments wasn't for us uh, to be able to keep them. The reason for the commandment was for us to see our inability to keep it so that we would then turn to God, amen, and be blessed by him. Let all the glory go to God instead of us trying to measure ourselves among ourselves and be something more than what we're capable of being. We just fall on the mercy of God, amen. So I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. There is therefore now, now wait a minute, let's back up. We didn't get all of it here. Let me, let me go back to. Romans uh, 7 and verse 25. Okay, well, I, back up then. I'm sorry, Sheila. Back up to uh, verse uh, 21. No, 22. That'll be good enough. Back up to verse 22. I'm sorry. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Now, this is Paul. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Now, Paul was an expert in the law. He was the Pharisee of Pharisees. He, he knew this forwards and backwards. And, and this is what he's saying. He's, this is Paul now. He says, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. My spirit wants to do everything that the law commands. But I see another law in my members, in my flesh. Right. Amen. And it's warring against the law that's in my mind. In other words, I know that's what I want to do. How many have ever been there? Yeah. But I didn't do it. I failed. I failed. Backed out of it. I twisted around it. I, I, I just wasn't able to, to keep it. So there's a battle going on here. What I want to do, I can't do. Right? And so it brings me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. It makes me totally conscious of sin all the time. Because I'm always measuring against what I want to do, what I know to do, and what I'm actually doing. And even when I'm doing what I know to do, I'm never doing it quite as well as I know I should do it. I'm always coming up a little short. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? 
So who's going to deliver me from this constant warring between the commandment and my inability to keep it? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. He's just being honest. He's saying, I know what I want to do, but I know also know what I'm doing. There is therefore now, why? Because of Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So who are not following after uh, the legalistic way of doing things, but falling on Jesus. How many of you know, no, it doesn't take any spiritual effort or let me say it this way, it doesn't take any spiritual uh, ability to do what the law tells you to do. It takes discipline. It takes no faith. There's a command, you just do it. It doesn't take any faith to do it. It takes willpower, self-will. Amen? And so Jesus comes along, and Paul's explaining that and tells us, all the time I'm doing this, I'm in condemnation. Whether anybody else is judging me or not, I'm judging myself constantly, and the enemy is always coming to remind me that I'm coming up short. And the Word itself tells me that according to the law, I'm failing. Amen? So Paul says that thank God that through Jesus, and we know that by the, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So he's saying that thank God for grace for the message of the gospel that Jesus has brought because it puts me in a place where I'm now no longer under any condemnation. How can I not be under any condemnation? There is no demand on me from the law. Jesus has fulfilled it. Praise the Lord. So a high view, you know, a high view of the law destroys any notion that we can do it. It, it, it does away with it. And now when we read that, you know that there's always a suspicion. People, I mean, I, I'm talking about religious people now. They love Romans 7. Romans 8 just really messes them up. I mean, Romans 7 tells you, yeah, yeah, we're up, we're down, we're trying, I'm doing better than that. You know, I'm doing more than I'm not doing, and I'm, I'm getting closer, but I'm not quite there, but I'm, I'm better than so-and-so, and I'm a lot better than I was, and I'm, I'm, but I, I want to be even better yet. And that's true of all of us. That's what we want. But it's a constant condemnation coming to us all the time because if we're at all honest with ourselves, we know we're not doing it. We're not keeping it. And so when you get to that scripture, the average religious person goes, yep, I get it. I'm, I'm with you there in Romans 7. And the minute you step over into Romans 8, which actually is just a continuous writing, which is what the Bible is, a continuous writing. It, it wasn't written in chapters and verses, and they weren't numbered, and they were just, it was just a continuous writing. Amen? So there's no break in thought or intent from Paul 7.25 to Romans 8.1. It's a continuous thought that's just flowing from him, and he's just writing it down. Amen? So there is therefore now condemnation. Praise the Lord. And there's always going to be this suspicion regarding the radicality, you could say, the radicalness of grace in comparison to the law. It just looks like there's, they don't belong in the same book. You know, amen, from, the, from a religious perspective. But this unconditional grace that keeps coming to us causes us to think, I don't believe I can keep the law but I don't have to because somebody has kept the law in my place. So as long as we're thinking about this, how radical grace is, how, how unconditional grace is, we're all right. The moment we step away from that, we're thinking, somehow I can keep this law. If I work hard enough, if I fast long enough, if I if I read enough, if I pray enough, if I do enough, I, get the personal pronoun here, I'm, I, 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 it's all about what I am going to do or think I'm going to do that's going to change everything. Amen? All right, Romans chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them, who are under the law, 
so that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Now, let me ask you just a quick question here. We know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. Now, who's under the law? Anybody who's not saved. Anybody who hasn't been born again is still being measured and judged by the law and will be all the way to the end. The only way you escape that judgment, the judgment of the law, the curse of the law, is by coming to Christ and receiving his grace. Now, it's amazing to me how religious people who have great, uh, low, I want to say in, uh, revelation, but it isn't revelation, have great resources of information have failed to understand how divisive this is and how divisive it was intended to be, to separate from law to grace, from old covenant to new covenant. Amen? So that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. The reason for the law is so that everybody will shut up about how righteous they are and become aware of their guilt before God, no matter how good they are, they're still failures in keeping the law. All, that means every, that none left out, have come short of the glory of God, have sinned and come short, amen? Therefore, by the deeds of the law, you can remind them that all the things you're doing, all of the effort, all of the work, all of the self-promotion, all of the, that you're doing by the deeds of the law, shall no, none, any flesh be justified in God's sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The more you focus on the law, the more sin is revealed. Yes. Personally and with others. Yes. Amen. And so therefore by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. By the law is the knowledge of sin. Praise the Lord. Now, only... Only an inflexible picture of what God demands is able to penetrate the depth of our need and convince us that we never outgrow our need for grace and that grace never gets overplayed. Where sin abounds, grace does that much more abound. It's only by grace and the comparison with the law that we come to an understanding where we can be convinced that we don't ever outgrow our need for grace. Grace isn't a one-time thing. I remember him talking about years ago, talking about, you know, one trip to the cross is not enough for anybody. You need to go back and repent. You need to go back and go back and go back and go back to the cross. That's, that is absolutely unbiblical. It is once and for all, for everybody. Grace continues. Jesus is forever seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession. He's not up there saying... Uh, forget about what Sally just did. Don't look at what Tammy just did. Don't look at Roberto. Don't look at Timothy. Don't look at Nathan. No, he's, that's not what he's doing. He's saying his very presence is a continuous rebuttal to any attack of the enemy and our own flesh that says sin. He says innocent. Period. For every believer, grace is sufficient for whatever we're going through. Amen. So that we never outgrow the need for grace. Okay, how long you live for God? Grace is something that has to continuously be flowing into our lives. Praise the Lord. In spite of what a lot of Christianity uh, would have you believe, the biggest problem facing the church is not cheap grace. That was a word I heard. The problem with the church is not cheap grace. The problem with the church is cheap law. We don't take the law as serious as we should. Therefore, we don't feel we have a need for grace. Yeah. Because we think we can do some things that are commanded, we don't feel like we need grace. Well, if you don't need grace, you're in the wrong place. Because that's the only way God will save you. He will not save you by your own works. He's already told us that. By the works of the law, no flesh is justified. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes. Jesus kept the law perfectly. Did he escape judgment? No. Somebody's got to pay. Mm -hmm. Somebody's got to pay for not keeping the law. The only one who can pay for not keeping the law is someone who did. 
That's Jesus. None of us, just Jesus. Amen? The idea that God accepts anything less than the perfect righteousness of Jesus is a lie. He demands perfection. Unflexible, unbending, unchanging, commanded to do, it must be done. God doesn't waver. He doesn't say, well, you know, I kind of like Jane a little bit more than I like Sally. She tries a little harder, so I'm giving her some, I'm giving her a pass here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let her get by without being perfect, but I'm going to, see, it just doesn't work. His, his demand is absolute. It's inflexible. It's unchanging. It stays the same. The law will always be the same. Not one dot, not one tittle will change, amen, in the law forever. Exactly. The law is the, the perfect holiness and righteousness of God. Yes. Amen? So it's not going to change. Somebody had to do something to make us able to approach God without being that perfect person without being able to keep the law. Uh-huh. And by Jesus keeping the law, for us, the law has been done away with. Read it. The Bible tells us. I know we get, we, we get nervous when that kind of stuff comes, but I'm telling you, you have no idea how radical grace really is. Mm-hmm. We think we get it, but it's it, every time we really go a little bit further into what grace really is, uh-huh. we start getting paranoid. Uh-huh. Yep. Because we are so grounded in this do, do, do stuff that we can't imagine that our job is simply to rest in what he has done, to rest in the finished work of Jesus. God sees us perfect and righteous. You'll never be that. I don't care how good of a person, how faithful you are to your church, your denomination, how good you are to to other people. It it doesn't buy you anything except maybe the favor of other human beings who are operating in the same way way. Grace is the thing that Jesus was talking about when he said, whom the sun sets free, free indeed. Completely free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Romans chapter 9 and verses 31 through 33. While we're going there, uh, let me say this. You know, the Bible talks about, and I think I mentioned it Wednesday night. All of us know this. We've gone through it many, many times. But, you know, putting old, old or new wine into old wine skins, you lose both. You lose the wine and the container. Uh, you don't mix the linen with wool throughout the Old Testament. And any mixture is bad. Amen. Paul was talking to uh, the Hebrews, in fact, and he talks about the very fact that uh, when you, you've got to either have one or the other or you lose both. You're either going to keep the law, and he says it's not enough to keep most of the law. You've got to keep every single detail of the law, or else you failed the entire law. Mm-hmm. Right? So he's, he's telling them that you can't have a little bit of grace. In other words, you can't have enough grace to get you by the tenth commandment. You know, you kept the first nine, but the tenth is tough. And so I need a little grace for that. It doesn't work that way. You keep every, and it's not just Ten Commandments, there's like 600 and some laws, uh, amen, that were in the uh, Torah or in the uh, Hebrew uh, uh, demands from God, their commandments, and uh, if you miss one, in fact, there's even, there was even uh, uh, a, a, a situation where the high priest, if he, even if he, he, didn't, he hadn't committed any sin that he was aware of, but for fear that he might go to sleep and have a dream that was unclean, they'd keep him up all night the night before the, the Day of Atonement. Because that would be guilt. And then he would die when he went into the, to take the blood into the Holy of Holies to sprinkle the mercy seat, and the people of Israel would not be spared. Uh-huh. Praise the Lord. So, but Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Now, they were trying to be righteous, and I, I don't, I, I'm going to give everybody the benefit of the doubt that belongs to any church anywhere. They're trying to attain to righteousness. Otherwise, they wouldn't go to church. They wouldn't belong to a church. They wouldn't have nothing to do with the church. So I'm, I'm not questioning their, their motive. I'm questioning their understanding. Right. So, But Israel, which 
followed after the law of righteousness hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, or because they sought it not by faith. The reason for 31 is answered in 32. Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. What we were talking about just a moment ago, I said there, there, it takes no faith to do this. There's no, there's no need for faith to keep rules. You've got to have faith to trust that his sacrifice was sufficient. Exactly. That's why you believe and then confess. You don't need to believe or confess anything to do this. You just got to do it. Right. It takes no faith. It takes no relationship. It just takes effort. Praise the Lord. But as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone. We know who the stumbling stone is. It's in the person of Jesus, and, Je and Jesus is grace. Yes. Just as God is love, Jesus is grace. Yes. They stumbled <coughs> over grace. Yes, grace was provided in the person of Jesus, and they didn't accept it because it didn't fit their paradigm as far as what religion should require. He comes along and starts turning everything upside down from a religious perspective, and they trip over the fact that here is the answer to what you've been trying to do for 2,000 years. Yep. And they stumble over and ignore. They stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. Nothing's changed, folks, because when you really start talking about grace to religious people, yes. whew, they'll get hot in a heartbeat. They, they will get upset because, amen, it is a stumbling stone. It is an offense to them to think that you're getting by with cheap grace when they're struggling with this great demand of the law. Praise the Lord. Zion, some, a rock of offense. And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. What do we just say? There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no shame for your weakness. Because your weakness is made perfect, amen, or strength is made perfect in your weakness. Yes. It's your inability to do this that glorifies God for out eternity because everyone is going to look at the grace of God and see what a great, loving, wonderful, merciful God he was. And all the time they thought he was some ogre or some bad guy just waiting to smack him down the first chance he got. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Whoever believes in him will not be ashamed. Praise the Lord. Cheap law is false grace. Any law that people try to tell you that doesn't demand perfectly keeping the law. I'm thinking about Tim talking about this several times. I, I thought about it myself because I do it. And probably most of us do. But when I'm driving five miles over the speed limit, like I'm on a trip on the interstate, and believe me, when I get on the interstate, I think I'm on the Audubon, because I'm just going, <laughs> however fast everybody else goes, I go. <laughs> so if it's the speed limit is 75 and I'm doing 80, I'm thinking, it's okay because I'm in the flow. I'm, I'm going with everybody else. Actually, what I'm thinking is they can't stop all of us. <laughs> it's the Lord. And I'm thinking I'll be the one that gets by. But what we, what we do is we say, okay, it's not sin because it's just a little bit over the speed limit. Right. You know, it's not really breaking the law because it's just a little bit off. Right. But now, if I was doing 100, then I can understand why. I mean, that's just insane. But that's what God is trying to get us to understand. One mile over is breaking the law. 100 miles over is no greater no. sin in the eyes of God than the one mile. It's just that the way out there sin will get you into way more trouble quicker. Yes. Yes. But you're still in trouble. Exactly. You're all, you've already broken the law. You're already messed up. Yep. Praise the Lord. So cheap law or law that doesn't demand perfection is a false gospel. Yes. Anybody who's preaching you just do the best you can, and then grace will take up the rest. You do everything here that you can. If you miss it a little bit, then grace will move in and take over for you. That is a false gospel. It's cheapening the, the, the demands of God's holiness. It's making God less than what God is. God is perfectly holy, without sin. 
And he demands for anyone to be in his presence to be the same. He will not interact with sin. So he pays the price for it. So that we can have or come boldly, is his words, to the throne of grace. So we can come without any fear of rejection or judgment or condemnation. We just come and his arms are open. This is my beloved child, son, daughter, in whom I am well pleased. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. See, it's only, only if we understand that. God's law is absolutely inflexible. Only if we understand that are we going to see God's grace is absolutely pertinent and imperative. If you don't realize how great the demand of the law is, you'll never understand how great the gift of grace really is. It's not a choice. It's not a uh, either or. Or I should say, it's, it's not a, a question of and or. It's a question of either or. One or the other is all you're going to get. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. See, a high view of the law involves the constant reminder that God's acceptance of us is ultimately and totally contingent on Christ's perfection and not our abilities. Amen. It's his perfection, not my progress. On his imputation, not on my improvement. Period. That's why it's amazing grace. That's why it seems like it's too good to be true because on any natural format, it would be untrue. Mm -hmm. It would be too good. Praise the Lord. See, the strict, inflexible demands <coughs> of the law push us towards the perfect, unfailing deliverance that we have in the gospel. It's the only thing that can do it. The only thing that will really cause us to come to God is the inability to get there on our own. Yeah. The only thing that will bring us to a place where we trust in his goodness mm -hmm. is to come to the end of ours. Yes. That's why Paul said, and you would think Paul from a religious perspective, was about as good as you could get. I mean, he wasn't just a believer and a teacher and a Pharisee and so forth, but he was actually a persecutor of anybody who didn't believe what he believed was the truth. He was killing them. Not unlike uh, the uh, radical Islam today. Well, I know that went down like a <laughs> dose of salt, as they used to say. But it's, it's true. They're convinced the things that they do are the things that's going to get them some kind of favor with God. Yes. And the more dramatic and the more outrageous they are, the greater God's going to like it. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Amen. In other words, we either trust God in the grace of God. Well, you better get on your work gloves mm -hmm. and go to it. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right, last scripture here. Uh, Romans chapter 10, verses 3 through 11. <clears throat> and how you can tell when people are questioning you and judging you or trying to uh, demean you, religiously speaking, for your stand on grace, is apparent. Were well, they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God? So I'm not judge. I, I don't have to worry about it. I'm not going to. But based on the scripture, People that are going about to establish their own righteousness have no righteousness. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Going about
about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves under the righteousness of God. This isn't, a, this, this, this isn't about a relationship with God. This is about somebody trying to be God. Right. It's, it goes all the way back to the garden. When you start learning the difference between good and evil, you'll be like God. When you know how to discern, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that, then you'll be like God. No, God is righteous. There's only one way for us to become righteous. Uh-huh. That's by a gift from God. Yes. Because you can't get the righteousness that we're after, the righteousness of God, by our own righteousness, by our own righteous acts. Amen? The only way you get them is by submitting to his righteousness. It's like the, 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 the I think it was Joseph Prince that had the story about the guy with the, uh, the, the shepherd going after the lamb. The lamb representing, and we were talking about here this morning, different ones saying, you know, Jody had posted about those that know the Lord, you know, they hear his voice, they recognize his voice, and they follow. Well, the lamb, what, what does he do? What does he do to repent? He doesn't do anything. He just consents to be saved. He's just consenting to be taken back and put back in the fold and protected. Yes. There's nothing he can do except run away. He can escape. He can avoid the, the, the saving of, of the shepherd. But the only thing he can do to be saved is submit to being saved. Sure. Praise the Lord. So themselves in the righteous. For Christ is the end of the law for the righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. So we go back to what I was talking about before. This tells you, you have to do it. You have got to do it. Amen? The righteous, and, and it doesn't require any faith. That's what he just told you. There's no faith required in this. It's just effort. It's just hard work on your part. You just put your nose to the grindstone and keep at it. But the righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above? Who shall ascend into the deep, that is to bring Christ again from the dead? But what saith? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. And again, he's just talking about, you know, one sacrifice for all. It was done once. It's not happening again. It's not going to happen over and over and over. You're not going to get it by doing stuff yourself. You're going to get it by what he, he did, by his finished work. Amen? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Amen. Praise the Lord. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. That's how you're righteous. Yes. By believing, not by doing. Praise the Lord. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. That word heart is not the blood pump. He's talking about the spirit of man. Amen. Which comes alive through the born again experience. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Again, not be under any kind of condemnation, right? In other words, a high view of the law produces a high view of grace. The greater you understand law, the greater regard you have for the commandments of God, the greater, the higher the level of grace is, amen, in reality in your life. You cannot have a low view of, of grace and have a high view of the law. Because if you have a high view of the law, it's going to drive you or run you right to grace. Amen. The only way you can have a low view of grace is to have a low view of the law. Yes. I don't need it because I can do this. Yes. Or I can do it pretty good at least. Yeah. I can do it better than I did before I was saved. Yeah. Yeah. Praise the Lord. A low view of law, a low view of grace. Praise God. All right, I lied before, and I do have one more scripture, but I have grace. Praise the Lord. So, one more scripture, and I'll tell you a little story, and, and we'll wrap it up. Praise the Lord. Acts chapter 13. Acts 13, verses 38 and 39. Acts 13, 38 and 39. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that though that through this man, talking about Jesus, be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, all that believe are justified. By him. Uh-huh. Not by all the, all the believers, but by him, all that believe are justified from all things 
from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Tell that to your religious friend the next time they start talking about greasy grace or cheap grace or hyper grace. Tell them it's the only way to escape the curse of the law. By him, all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. You couldn't be justified by trying to keep it. You can only be justified by believing in him who did, who justified you by his righteous act of keeping the law. Praise the Lord. All right, now, here's, I'll just wrap up with this little uh, metaphor, if you will, or parable. Hunters, there's a couple of hunters, and they're out hunting whatever, I don't know, ducks or pheasant or something. It's in a grassland, grassland a, bar, a barren area. And uh, out where we live, uh, man, we saw at least 15 deer hunters this morning just between my house and the river, which is two miles, yeah. something like that. Now, I told Sally at the time, personally, uh, I'm rooting for the deer. <laughs> but that's, that's a whole other story, praise the Lord. No, I, I get it. I, I hunted all my life as a kid growing up. Uh, after the military, I kind of lost my, my interest in it. But uh, anyway, I, I get it. You know, I loved it growing up as a kid. That's all we ever did was hunt and fish and get up before school and go duck hunting. Five o'clock in the morning, and so we'd come home, go to school at eight o'clock. Did it year round. Rabbits, squirrels, pheasant, yeah. quail, anything that we could shoot, we would shoot it. Praise the Lord. So I get it. And anyway, these two hunters, they're out in this uh, this wide open barren grassland area. And when you see the prairies, I started to say down around our place, we think of grasslands as being like your backyard. That's not the way. Prairies, I mean, the grass is growing this high, at least. Mm-hmm. You'd see, you know, uh, pictures of the Midwest and the prairie states mm-hmm. back in the 1800s. You'll see it's just grassland everywhere. I mean, it's just mm-hmm. thick. So anyway, they're out there, and uh, they're hunting, and, he, and one of them notices off in the distance is the cloud of smoke. They don't think too much of it, and they, they continue walking through the, through the grass, and pretty soon they hear this crackling sound. And the wind came up, and they realized this is a brush fire. It's a grass fire. And it's coming their way, and it's coming really fast. The wind is just whipping it up, and the grass is just, you know, boiling over with fire. And uh, it's moving so fast that they couldn't outrun it. So one of them is digging around his pockets, and the other says, what are you you looking for? And he said, matches, matches. And the guy said, matches? We got a fire coming down on top of us. He finds the matches, and he takes them out, and he starts a fire in an area all around them, and it burns out a circle. And then he says, now get in the circle. So they get in the circle, and uh, they, they take their handkerchiefs out and put them over their nose and their mouth, and they're standing in this circle of burned over earth waiting for this brush fire to come. And it wasn't very long before standing there trying to breathe through their handkerchiefs that the fire just flows right up to them and sweeps right over them. Mm-hmm. Neither of them were hurt. They weren't even touched. The fire would not burn the place where the fire had already burned. And the point is, the law is like a brush fire. It doesn't take prisoners. It can't be escaped, it can't be extinguished, you can't outrun it, you can't hide from it. But if we stand in the burned over place where the Lord has already been burned, if we stand in that place where the fire has already done its worst, we won't get hurt. It's power. The power of the fire, the power of the law, hasn't been nullified. Amen? Its authority cannot be denied. But because of where we are, standing on the rock, it can't touch us. The death of Jesus is the burned over place. 
It's there that we stand amazed <coughs> and yet relieved. Where there was guilt, just gratitude. And that's my word for you today. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. So the next time the enemy comes to tell you you're not good enough, you're not doing enough, or somebody else, or this, or that, just go, you smell that? <laughs> I smell smoke. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Where I'm standing, the fire of hell cannot touch. Amen. It's already been a burned over field as far as God is concerned, and you cannot have what God has declared to be his own. Praise the Lord. There's no such thing as hyper grace. You can't make grace too hyper. You, you can't make it too much. You can't overplay grace. You can't outdo it. It's anything less than the extreme radicalness of grace is a denial of the effort that Jesus Christ put into your salvation to see all of man saved. Anything less than that is a lie and a false gospel. Praise the Lord. He did it all. And I love the scripture where it says he does all things. Amen. He left nothing undone. He's looking at the new creation the same way he looked at the, at the original creation. He's looking at it and he's saying, this is good. This is very good. The new creation is perfect, without flaw, without spot, without wrinkle. It is the church of the living God. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. God bless all of you. Appreciate you being here today. Enjoy the rest of your day. Hope we'll see you back here Wednesday and Friday. Amen. Praise God. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. And Sunday. And Sunday. Don't forget the soup. If you can't bring soup, bring a spoon. <laughs>